Okay, good morning, everyone. I want to introduce our guest, Rick Hirschhout. Let me read your bio, if I may, Rick, first of all, so people have a sense of what you've done. It's a long bio. It may take up a lot of our hour, but for good reason. Oh, boy. Uh, <laughs> so Richard Hirschhout became director of AJC Los Angeles. That's American Jewish Committee Los Angeles in September of 2019. He's the organization's chief strategist and principal spokesperson in advancing AJC's global advocacy mission in Southern California. We'll talk about that. Leading a vibrant leadership network and talented professional team. Rick brings to this position more than 30 years of civil rights, humanitarian, and Jewish communal advocacy, serving in senior professional roles across the US with the Anti-Defamation League, Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center, American Jewish Joint Distribution Committee, and American Friends of Rambam Medical Center. Rick is a builder and an innovator who's worked to advance human rights and democratic values, enhance intergroup understanding, we'll talk plenty about that today, and promote the security and well-being of Jews and other vulnerable communities in the United States, Israel, and around the world. His work with NGOs has included efforts to advance human, humanitarian medical aid and peaceful coexistence in Israel and neighboring countries. He has led fact-finding missions to Israel, Ukraine, Ethiopia, and Cuba. He's also spearheaded international efforts to mark the 20th commemoration of the 1994 genocide against the Tutsi in Rwanda. Previously, Rick led the creation and establishment of the Illinois Holocaust Museum and Education Center as its founding executive director. The museum opened in 2009 to international acclaim and participation of President Bill Clinton, Nobel laureate and Holocaust survivor Elie Wiesel, and an audience of 13,000. Under his leadership, the museum hosted over a half million visitors, including heads of state and other dignitaries. In 2013, Rick received an Emmy Award as co-producer, co-executive producer of the nationally broadcast documentary, Skokie, Invaded But Not Conquered. Rick also enjoyed a 21-year tenor with the Anti-Defamation League, including a decade as Midwest Regional Director. He built bridges between the African-American and Jewish communities and worked closely with law enforcement on issues of anti-Semitism and extremism. His achievements were recognized with the FBI's Community Leadership Award and the City of Chicago's Human Relations Award. Rick and his wife, Susan, a native of LA of Los Angeles, are the proud parents of two adult children. He holds a bachelor's degree in international relations and Judaic studies from Tulane University has studied at Hebrew University's Rothberg School for Overseas Students. He grew up in upstate New York and in Knoxville, Tennessee. So Rick, I want to welcome you to Valley Outreach Synagogue and Center for Jewish Life and to that virtual thing that is VOS. And to thank you very much for this conversation, for the time that you're giving us. It's absolutely my pleasure and uh, a Shana Tova to you, Rabbi, and to uh, and to your uh, minions all throughout uh, the valley. It's, it's really a pleasure to be with you all today. Thank you. What's interesting now in relation to this virtual world, and I don't know if you're seeing it at AJC in any way, but a synagogue used to be member, you know, the members of a synagogue were defined by proximity, right? You know, typically you had to walk to your shul, so that's where you lived. Well, now it's not even that. We're having people joining us from all over the country because they're saying, can I join the synagogue this year from Memphis or from Dallas or from Washington State? We're saying, sure. So much of what we're doing is online. And even services bringing people into the sanctuary online uh, creates obviously a little silver lining for uh, this COVID era. And it expands the community. It really is. Um, you know, there, there, are, there are some silver linings. That's, that's a wonderful it's a wonderful development. Definitely. Uh, I want to talk to you, first of all, about something that's pressing in terms of what people are talking about. And I have a number of people who say to me, yes, we're watching the news and there's so many competing crises right now. And there are four or five at least that are on everybody's minds. But maybe some people feel that we're not talking enough about anti-Semitism. And since you have so much uh, knowledge and such a strong background in that area, I wanted to just ask you for some insights so we get a sense of 
maybe what's unique about this period, maybe what's just a continuity of anti-Semitism. There's one aspect of anti-Semitism that I'm noticing that seems to be maybe modern, but maybe it was framed this way in other periods as well, which is it's become political. In, the, in other words, people talk about anti-Semitism from the left and anti-Semitism from the right. They're not talking about anti-Semitism. So is that something we inherited from Europe? Is that just a reality that's always been? Has it always well, been tied with politics? Well, I think we've certainly seen uh, when extreme voices, whether emanating from the left or the right, um, vent uh, hateful epithets, anti-Semitic, uh, racist epithets, whatever it might be to uh, target and, and scapegoat what they see as, as the other what they see as uh, groups that are, are uh, toxic or unwelcome or somehow less than in, in American life, that um, uh, there, there is a certain meeting in the middle, honestly. If you go far enough to the left or far enough to the right, it is in many respects a, a continuum and a, and a circle that, that, does, that does connect. Uh, extremism is extremism. But to your question about about anti-Semitism, I would argue that we've seen certainly a steady rise in recent years. The FBI statistics, the annual uh, survey, the annual uh, audits that the Anti-Defamation League has conduct conducted for more than three decades uh, bear this out, that the highest uh, number of religiously motivated bias incidents, episodes, some criminal, others not criminal, but, but certainly rise to the level of, uh, of hateful and, and unwelcome, are in fact uh, anti-Semitic, anti-Jewish incidents. What happened in Pittsburgh and following in Poway uh, was in, in many respects uh, unprecedented and, and a game changer, a sad game changer for the American Jewish community. And we have, uh, uh, I think endeavored in the in the months and now uh, years since uh, short years since uh, the, those horrific events to uh, to try to regain our equilibrium to try to uh, understand how we can proudly uh, practice and worship uh, and be and be uh, American Jews with the full protection of what it means to live in our democratic society, but do it in a way, in a way that uh, ensures our safety and our security without at the same time uh, creating fortresses, without um, somehow being seen as unwelcoming to the community. And this is, that's the ripple effect that, that those terrible tragedies have had upon our, our physical institutions. And of course, those physical institutions have have had a different uh, reality to contend with, as you alluded to a few minutes, a few moments ago, with respect to uh, our virtual, our now virtual world. But anti-Semitism um, has always been with us, but has uh, certainly increased in recent in recent years, and we see it playing out on college campuses. We see it playing out uh, in public, uh, in the public domain. We see some elements of anti-Semitism among some of the extreme voices who have exploited the otherwise you know, peaceful, uh, hopeful protests that, that have played out in recent months in the wake of, of the George Floyd killing and Breonna Taylor and others. And it's something we need to uh, call out. We have to, to educate and, and illuminate and help people understand uh, what anti-Semitism looks like especially if they may be uh, participating or contributing to its spread. Yeah, I, I remember, um, you know, we're aware that this feels very recent, you know, last number of years, whatever number of years it is that we're aware of American anti-Semitism in this way. I remember going to the Museum of Tolerance in LA years and years ago when I lived in Pico Robertson, that area. And I remember going in with a group of kids and there was a map on the wall. I don't know if that display is still there. And it showed extremist groups around America. And it showed California, I think, had the highest number. 
Is California has had, a, has had a high number for, you, for many years, yes. And what are these groups? And are they dormant? Are they really harmless groups that, you know, throw darts together? Are they drinking beer together? Are they doing more harm than that? So the, uh, these groups are, are by no means static, and sometimes they uh, you know, crawl back under the proverbial rock. Other times they are um, exposed, and where there's, there's criminal behavior and, and charges can be brought, that will sometimes lead to their, um, to, you know, to their uh, end. But there is a constant um, reimagining and re-shaping and re, uh, uh, of these groups. So what 25 years ago would have been the, uh, the skinhead phenomena right. and identifiably so uh, closely shaven heads, uh, swastika and other tattoos, other indicia of hate that, that people would wear um, literally tattooed on their, on their bodies and, uh, and violent, vicious uh, assaults and, and uh, mayhem uh, perpetrated. We don't hear about skinheads anymore, much less so, but there are groups that have, uh, have successfully exploited the, both the technology and at times the anonymity that uh, the internet, that the web uh, allows. Just as we, you know, we, we have uh, all the good that, that an interconnected world right. can bring to us, there is uh, still remaining that dark underbelly of hate and those who will who will um, utilize those platforms and those modalities uh, to, to spew their venom. So it, it it shifts, it changes. Today we see the the um, most recently this QAnon phenomena, right. which is as bizarre and conspiratorial and nonsensical as 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 any um, uh, ideology that we've we, we've seen in terms of hate in America. Nonetheless, it persists. It provides uh, an easy answer, a simple solution for those who are trying to understand um, uh, the source of, of, of their problems or their unhappiness. It's a different way of, of scapegoating and, and um, there is no sense to it, but it is with us. Yeah, I, I remember having a conversation with the head of the anti-terrorism division for LAPD and we were at a Muslim iftar together. That's where we met. And that's where I met Saba Somech, um, who represents AJC. And I said to him, how do you get past the head nodders? All of us have the people, we say, preaching to the choir. In other words, who's watching this? Good people. People who really care about these issues. How do you get past us, the many of us, who care about these issues and get through to the people who are on the outside, who are on the outside because they are on the outside. They feel disenfranchised. They're not usually parts of these kinds of healthy communities. And they are in many cases, what we're seeing is hateful. How do you get past the good to get to the people who are actually um, ignorant, who are bigoted? How, how do we do that? Is the internet doing that or is it actually somehow missing those people in its education efforts? I would argue, uh, in my experience and from our vantage point at, at HJC, uh, the internet is not as helpful. It has not been uh, put to as good a, uh, a use as as it could be, and it and it uh, and it and it should be. For us, I, I think, and I think the larger answer is, for the good people who who are listening, who are tuning in, who are. Uh, caring about the kind of society and world uh, we're going to, to live in, especially as we, God willing, begin to come out of, come out of uh, the pandemic, we have to raise our voices. We have to have conversations with neighbors, with associates. We need to be writing letters to the editor as kind of old school as that might sound. We need to be ensuring that, uh, that our school systems, public, private, parochial, are providing opportunities to learn about and understand and appreciate our diversity. We're in the midst right now of, uh, of a, a serious issue with respect to the creation of a model ethnic studies curriculum uh, for high school age students right. uh, that would be mandatory across the state of California. And it is a, um, 
the initial draft and now a, a, a second iteration that has been released one year later is still wholly inadequate, uh, takes a very negative view toward um, uh, any group, any ethnic group that is not part of a, sort of the four um, oppressed peoples historically within the United States. And, and uh, the Jewish community uh, loses out if we're not able to somehow uh, shift the paradigm and enlarge the narrative so that teaching about ethnic studies really is teaching about the richness of our diversity in the most diverse state in the country. That's not to ignore our, the necessity of teaching um, the darker chapters and understanding, as we've, as we've seen come to the fore just in these recent months, structural racism, inequities across our society. But we've got to do this, um, we've got to do this in a way that is much more big tent and much more uh, inclusive and hopeful because we're still trying to figure this out in America. 400 years is not a very long time in the, in the, in the annals of, uh, of human history. Yeah, I think that's the reality. I often think when we look at Israel, the same thing. This is a baby. This is a nation in its infancy, and look what it's already achieved. And yes, can we find fault? Absolutely. And as you say, in our young country as well, relatively, maybe we're teenagers in terms of world nations. We're still developing and growing. And what I'm seeing and valuing that I'm sure you are as well is the fact that we're in a country where we can have these conversations, where people can march and hold banners and people where, where people can write to editors and where people can lobby and have the kinds of conversations that we're having. So I think in that sense, we have greater hope or I certainly am more hopeful than I might've been in other eras or in other cultures because we have the structure to do better than we've done in the past. Um, I remember when a number of years ago, I was singing opera in Europe a lot. And uh, I didn't feel comfortable as a Jew in Europe at the time. I was very careful about my Judaism there. I remember walking between my apartment in Strasbourg mm -hmm. and the opera house. I had to walk across a great place, a great plaza. And there were constantly demonstrations and anti-Semitic signs and effigies being burnt and flags, flag of Israel being burnt. I remember walking to work to rehearsals one day past this group that was burning the Israeli flag. And for me, of course, is for you, that flag isn't just about a nation state, it's about our peoplehood and our identity. And I didn't know why my mood had changed. I just realized, because I'd spent so many weeks at that point alone, I heard, I, there was like a color shift in my head. And I thought, what happened today that I, you know, what did I notice along the way from this place to that that changed the way I felt? And it was clearly that. Another time I had another one of those realizations when I went to a patisserie in the days when I'd allow myself to. And uh, I again thought, oh, I, what's, what's dark in my mood? Why am I not as happy as I was? And I literally, because I had the time that morning, retraced my steps. And I looked around, what was it that shifted my feelings? And I went into the patisserie again. I looked at the table where I sat. Was there something there? And I turned around. And as I exited, I saw a French newspaper with a horrible graphic, anti-Semitic graphic. I said, okay, all right, now I know what happened. So that was then. And at the time, I think... As an American, I thought I can leave that and I can go back to this beautiful, diverse America where I don't need to have those fears. I remember at the time, as you do, I'm sure, the rabbi in Paris, chief rabbi saying, don't wear your yarmulkes outside. You know, there were all of these warnings about resurgence of what felt like dangerous anti-Semitism in Europe. Right. And then I feel like now the paradigm is the Europeans are looking at us going, you, what happened? You were the safe haven. You were the ones who were looking at us, critiquing us, and what it was that was structural in our society that allowed for this, and political in our society that allowed for this. And now, presumably, the world is looking at us and saying, it's come to you, it's come home to roost, it's living in your own society as well. That, to me, is alarming. You know, that's unnerving, the idea that something has shifted in our society in that way. We are living um, in a much coarser society. We are living in 
a society in which uh, people, it's perhaps it's human nature, you, you want to be part of the echo chamber that, that uh, concurs with or, or aligns with your, your worldview. And, and to, we can look at news networks that we might tap into, newspapers that we might read, uh, websites that we might uh, uh, subscribe to. And it's less about keeping an open mind and understanding that there is um, a diversity of opinion, which if expressed and conveyed in a civil way, is something that we can all uh, learn from and grow from as a, as a society. Unfortunately, we, are, we have become much too segmented and uh, fractious as, um, as, as, as one society. It's hard to, I know we wanna veer, steer clear of, of, uh, of politics and I don't think this though is really about partisanship. I think it's about uh, setting a tone, whatever uh, uh, political affiliation one might adhere to, it's the way in which we convey our message. It's the way in which we um, receive contrary information or counter messages. And we have forgotten how to uh, conduct ourselves, if you will, in a bipartisan way as a society. We don't need to be elected members of Congress in order to, uh, to, to have that sense of, of bipartisanship. It's really about civility and, and recognizing the humanity and the dignity of those with whom we may disagree. We've seen a, a, a terrible erosion of that civility. It's tearing at the fabric of our country. And this really is, I think, an inflection point for America. You can put it to, certainly we're going to have a, a national referendum uh, in the next uh, little more than a month, but it's not just that because there will be an outcome one way or the other from that, from that election. The question is how do we go forward as a society where we really are um, responsible for one another and, and, and view the world in that way. That I think is probably one of the, one of the overarching messages um, screaming out of the, the protests in the street that, and, and, the, and the protest being so uh, diverse, people from all walks of life, all socioeconomic strata uh, in, in our country. But it's really about how do we come to understand that we really are all in this together and, and what steps can we take to ensure that nobody is left out and that everybody is, is viewed as, as, as part of America. Yeah, Rick, I couldn't agree more and I have the same concerns. And we know that statistically half of the community, half of this family that is this country is going to be angry, disappointed, upset, in right. tears with the result of an election. And how do we set ourselves up, not from the top only, but from all levels and aspects of our society to come out of that? At, at just as we might say to ourselves, okay, we can get through the pandemic, but how are we gonna come out of it? Will we be better and stronger? How do we prepare for that re-entry to a new normal? I think the same question we have to ask ourselves, which is what's our part in the future? And what are we going to add to the story that's going to be positive? Um, it also makes me think about something I'm less comfortable with, which is what's our individual part in this. I don't ever want to think that racism and anti-Semitism should be blamed on the victim or any other isms, any of the, of the bigotries in our societies and world. world. But coming to Yom Kippur, you know, can we pound our chest figuratively and say, for the sin we've sinned before you, God, for in any way contributing to the acrimony, for in any way bifurcating, dividing, destroying the wholeness, the shlemut, the shalom of our world. And then the other part of it is, can we stand before God? Do we need to stand before God? And as Jews say, there's a part at in the story of anti-Semitism that might be separate from anti-Semitism it is itself, which is how Jews are in the world and do I as an individual have a role to play in being an ambassador for the best in Judaism in the way that I interact with somebody in the marketplace or on Facebook. 
I, I think that, that that is the the essential question as we enter into the days of awe and as we and as we plead uh, with with Yom Kippur uh, soon upon us uh, to be written in the book uh, for, for for another year. Have 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 we earned it? And 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 can we fulfill um, our pledge to uh, to do better and and to be better? The moment is so ripe for each of us as individuals to ask that question, to really uh, engage in that sense of self-examination and to think about all that we have in our world, whether it's our workplace, whether it's associations or clubs that we are part of, whether it is our neighborhood, what are we doing to improve the condition of our fellow human beings in this country? If we're in a position to, uh, to make hiring and employment related decisions, are we casting the net far and wide enough um, to be inclusive, to, be, uh, to, to make sure that there are opportunities um, to, be, to be explored on merit, on the basis of merit, no, I'm not, right. not, not suggesting uh, anything but, but to make sure that we're offering casting a wide enough net for that to happen. What are we, um, what kind of messages are we uh, putting forward uh, from the pedestals on which we, uh, you know, on, on which we, on we sit or stand? Uh, what is our message to the community? What is the message to our neighbors, to our friends, to the stranger? How are we um, doing our part to help those less fortunate and those disadvantaged disadvantaged uh, in the community. These are the essential questions that are, that are in front of us. They, they were, I think, laid bare during COVID before the protests in June. We saw uh, very clearly the uh, lack of access to quality health care by so many, the lack of access to, to uh, equal opportunity. Certainly, we saw the scapegoating and bigotry directed against so many in the Asian American community. That was messaging from on high and that was messaging that had a very um, toxic and, and corrosive uh, impact uh, on, on, on a person to person, you know, grassroots level. We have a chance to raise our voices. We have a chance to be heard. If we care, if any of us, you know, truly care about uh, police reform or, or social justice, make our voices heard. There is a brand new department out of the city of Los Angeles, Department of Human and Civil Rights that is being uh, created you know, as we speak, whose agenda is being uh, articulated. And that body is intended to set a certain tone across our community and to reach out and, and uh, call for the input, the voices, the participation of community members. That's that's one example of where we can um, make a difference. Each of us, let me say this, and I, and I know that, uh, that uh, our tradition teaches, and, and, and it's stated much more eloquently than, than I can, that, uh, that the entire uh, task is not upon uh, our individual shoulders, but there's a part of it that is. And we have to each, to the best of our ability, to the best of our our, our intellect and our passion and interest, do our part. Do our part to just move that needle a little forward. That's really, that's going to be the test of what we've learned coming out of the, uh, this very, very sad chapter with COVID and this, this uh, reckoning uh, out of tragedy that has, that has caused tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands around the country to, uh, to, to finally want to uh, help put America on a, on a better path, on a more constructive and hopeful path. Yeah, I'll say I'm in. Well said, I mean, you really articulate it well. You made me think about the number of Jewish people who I think aren't stepping up in the civil rights movement right now because they feel like they shouldn't or can't based on limited information or in some cases false information. So I see the same false information. I get the videos, I get the a message that will say there was a pogrom using that word in Fairfax area. And in reality, fact checking, there wasn't a pogrom. 
Yes, it was certainly a swastika on a synagogue, but it wasn't a pogrom. We know distinctly what that is and what that isn't. By the we way, all- I live I live exactly in the heart of, of the Fairfax district, and I have had to uh, push back against those exact uh, wild assertions uh, in the last in the last three months, and and to distinguish very very clearly uh, what was anti-Semitism, the singular episode that you described, and what was uh, simply not simply it, it was it was serious um, other acts of graffiti and much worse the yeah. rioting the looting that was not representative of the majority of the protesters, but was nonetheless uh, a terrible uh, stain upon their message. And that's, and that's something that, that cannot be tolerated. And, I, and I'll add that I, just a, a source of frustration and disappointment to me is that consistently some of the leaders of these protest movements have been uh, uh, too tepid and wanting to call out the criminal elements that have exploited some of these rallies have been too tepid and um, in, in, in conveying a message, they haven't done it unequivocally, that there is no place for, for violence or lawlessness or rioting because it does to, to countenance and to excuse such behavior by the smallest of a percentage of, of, of people on the street, but to excuse that behavior fundamentally undermines the, uh, the goodness of the overall message. And I've, I've been very frustrated by this, and I, I think there has been a failure to uh, hold some of these leaders' feet to the proverbial fire and, and, uh, and press them on this issue. They've been given a pass, and, and maybe it is a little bit of intimidation out there. Maybe it gets to the heart of of your, of your point, of your question of how do you, you know, is the welcome mat out? You know, is there a place, you know, for me uh, within, within this movement? It, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very serious uh, question. So what, looking at, at the backdrop, Black Jewish Unity, something you, you guys launched, AJC launched at the end of, or in mid-September, what is the role and how do we get Jews who are hesitant, reticent about coming into the tent, so to speak, to step forward? What are the values from your point of view that's, that make this uh, a given, you know, a, 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 something that's a, clearly aligned with our Jewish values and American values? Thank you. So the backdrop does speak to uh, what was a specific Black Jewish Unity Week that took place earlier this month, AJC in partnership with the National Urban League and the agenda was 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 pretty straightforward and uh, and, and simple, but I think uh, powerful nonetheless. It was to uh, celebrate the historic alliance between our two communities and to really reaffirm the relevance of that alliance today more than ever as we confront the common uh, enemies of ignorance and hate and anti-Semitism and racial bias. And so together, AJC and the National Urban League, more than just for that one week, we are embarking on a series of initiatives involving our our respective young leadership cohorts nationally to lock arms, to engage in joint collaborative projects. It's very reminiscent of the 60s. There was a lot of good there. And and it's to, to, to again, reassert and reclaim that important uh, legacy but at the same time to work together, to move forward, to try to get at some of the structural inequities that have been laid bare in recent months. And to do this together, because the truth is, anti-Semitism and racism are really two sides of the same coin. We have much more uh, to gain working together, not being at odds with one another. We had, uh, chatted a little earlier about some of the sometimes extremist voices uh, from, from both of our communities. Uh, I believe it is a mistake to, uh, to make a prerequisite or to draw a line in the sand that unless a particular uh, extremist voice or demagogue is denounced uh, from the outset, we have nothing to talk about. 
we can't we can't function that way. And I think we have to, in the process of building our relationship and building trust and building confidence, have those difficult conversations and not shy away from them, but have them in the context of the important work that needs to get done together and not to allow ourselves to be sidetracked or distracted by the, the voices of polarization who would love nothing more than to have uh, oxygen breathed into their sails. Yeah, it sounds like the what you gave was a recipe for decency and diplomacy, right? Well, it, it's, it's, it's not it's, only right. It's not only agree, you know having friends or even having alliances and conversations with people with whom we one hundred percent agree. Otherwise, we will never have a conversation. But instead, saying there's enough to agree upon and there's enough value to be shared, and we can get to those issues, talk about those issues that we disagree upon. Um, I. I think again, I think there's a tragedy in the fact that people are looking away because they'll say, for instance, they're equating um, Black Lives Matter with the movement for Black Lives. I, I can understand why, by the way. Right. And they're saying, well, Black, they're sending me messages. Black Lives Matter has a, in their platform, they denounce Israel, genocidal, apartheid, etc. cetera. Um, it's not the case. And I looked as I know you did and the organization did very carefully what they stand for, what they don't. But is there another organization with whom they're associated that does? Yes. Well, as you say, I fully agree in the micro as in the macro, we can't look at the element that divides us. We have to, it's imperative right now that we look at what can unite us, shared experience and shared values, which takes us to AJC as the, diplomatic corps for the Jewish people. What does that mean? Why do we need a diplomatic corps? Why was it established? How does it operate? So AJC is uh, probably our nation's oldest Jewish civil rights and human rights uh, organization. It goes back to 1906. We're sort of the big uh, sibling to the, to the ADL that was established in 1913. I, I spent, as you know, 21 years uh, at ADL, so I've, I've had the, the, the blessing of, of understanding and being uh, embedded in both uh, organizations. AJC has taken on, particularly in the last uh, 20 years or so, and this goes back to, those, uh, to the experience you had in, in Europe with anti-Semitism, has taken a, a view that the Jewish community needs a, a voice to push back as advocates against institutional anti-Semitism and to do so by building relationships and effectively establishing beachheads in capitals around the world. And so AJC, while an American organization, the Los Angeles, Southern California region is one of 22 offices around the country. We also have more than a dozen uh, operations, similar offices that are tailored to work in communities in Europe. We are, of course, in Jerusalem, and we have other institutes uh, across the globe that are there to put a face on the Jewish world, to, to be able to articulate uh, Jewish values and build alliances with governments, with civil society partners, and with uh, Jewish communities the world over so that there is a sense of, of um, of a voice when it comes to policy. I, I would argue that, um, or I would posit that one of the greatest uh, achievements of AJC in recent memory, and this speaks to our sort of our approach, we are not so much always in the weeds. We're not about sort of the, the identifying of an immediate problem, trying to solve that problem. We take a much larger kind of long-term view. And in, in this particular case, the recent announcement of, of uh, normalization of relations and, and what we just saw a week ago at the White House, the signing and the formalizing of that agreement between Israel and the UAE. AJC had a significant hand in that process. Ultimately, it was Israel's and the UAE's decision to make, but for more than 20 years, AJC professional staff and volunteer leadership, leadership from here in Los Angeles, have trekked to the UAE to meet with senior officials, 
to meet with society leaders and to build that relationship, to build confidence, to build trust in the hope that one day there would be the moment that we've seen over this last month. It is a glorious breakthrough, the first Arab country to normalize relations and establish peace with Israel in 26 years. And hopefully that's an average that's going to come way, way down in the, in the months and years ahead as we start to see, God willing, peace uh, breaking out um, in, parts of, in parts of the Middle East. Well, can you give us a little more detail? Because I think everybody's curious when something like that happens. How does it really happen? What led to it? What kind of conversations, negotiations? So what often happens, so that diplomatic piece really is a staple of AJC's diet. And that means on a regular basis, we are, whether it's in Washington with, with uh, the embassies, whether it's in New York with the permanent missions of, of various countries to the United Nations, or whether it's in other cities. Los Angeles, this came as a surprise to me, outside of Washington, outside of New York, Los Angeles has the largest uh, collection, largest uh, community of foreign consulates anywhere in the world. Oh, sort of, really? Sort of neck, no neck and neck with, uh, with Seoul, South Korea. More wow. than 100 foreign consulates, all but 20 of them, 20 or so, are professionally staffed. So they have their visa and consular section, but they also have their political, cultural, and diplomatic side. And we make it a steady practice at AJC to meet with the consuls general. Many of these individuals here in LA are, are, are on an upward trajectory, so may very well five years from now, 10 years of now, 10 years from now, either be an ambassador or potentially head of state. And these are relationships that are formed in a very personal way. Shabbat dinners, holidays, AJC organizes an annual Hanukkah reception uh, every year. This past year, it was held at the, the, the beautiful and, and new uh, Caton Children's Museum at Santa Monica Place. And so these are, it's about relationship building. That is, that is, that is the, I, I think the uh, sort of the, you know, the secret sauce of, of what AJC does. And we are, we, we take the long view, we are in it for the long haul. And so with respect to the UAE, my colleague, Jason Isaacson, who heads our Office of Government and Political Affairs in DC, has personally traveled to the UAE more than 20 times over the past wow. two decades. There's something that comes from that. And, and, Baby steps, incremental steps count and matter. And so much of that work has helped to lay the groundwork for what we now see, for now this, this, uh, uh, this piece. And that's, and that's, uh, you know, that, that's very much sort of the stock and trade of AJC. Similarly, we do the same with intergroup partners, with the Urban League, with Korean American organizations with Latino organizations. We do the same with faith partners of all, uh, of all denominations. We are uh, a steady, constant, consistent voice. What you see is what you get with AJC. And the way we go about this work is, 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 is really in clear partnership between our professional staff team and a dedicated, cadre of lay leadership all around the country and all around the world. And so for anyone today who is curious about this or perhaps didn't quite realize what we were all about, and I, I, I'll, I'll give a little, I'll confess that when you're doing that behind the scenes diplomatic work, you tend not to toot your own horn. And so it, it's a little counterintuitive where sometimes not as well known as we should be, given the impact that we have on the scale and scope that we have. So anyone who is interested in becoming part of AJC, you need only go onto our website, ajc.org, sign up to receive updates, contact the LA office. We have our own uh, mini webpage embedded in the agency's uh, website. And 
and, and you're in. That's, that, that's really the price of admission. It's just a matter of, of stepping up and, and raising your hand. Did I understand that what, you, what you're saying in some sense is, is you're a constant organization. There's constancy in what you do. It's about like any other relationship, consistency. What happens when you get with, let's say, UAE toward an agreement? Is agency, is, is AJC vitally still involved or is that the point when you step back and let world leaders and negotiators step in? You know, it's a great question. So, so when it becomes time to really consummate the, the deal, that's, that's an independent, that, that, again, that was the decision of the, of the UAE and, and the state of Israel, but we helped to, to set the table, if you will. And with respect to, you know, now what do we, okay, that, that's done, let's move on to the next. We are, and I think this is you know, a testament to the fact that we're, now that this, this momentous achievement has, has come about, within days, AJC announced that we will be opening an office in, uh, in the UAE. We will have a permanent presence on the ground to be able to continue to nurture those relationships, to encourage uh, uh, cross-pollination, cultural trade uh, missions, uh, you name it, we're, we're invested. And now that, that uh, the fruits of these labors uh, have, have come forward, it, it, we're doubling down. We will be there and we hope to be able to do the exact, do the exact same thing similarly in other Gulf states should they uh, come to this point or anywhere else, any other Arab capitals where um, we can begin to completely shift the paradigm uh, for the Middle East. Now, none of this, I, I should add, is to say that is to ignore or to somehow uh, minimize the continuing unresolved issues between Israel and the Palestinian Authority. Just about to ask you that, yeah. That is, that, that is still front and center. Hopefully, uh, a new uh, modality of dialogue leading to negotiations, leading to a negotiated uh, settlement uh, once and for all can be fueled by what's breaking out in the region. That, that for so many years, for decades, the, 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 the narrative or the mantra was first resolve the Palestinian issue, then we can talk about normalization of relations with other countries. That has been flipped on its head. The world is not any worse for it. In fact, we would argue is better because the table has been reset and there is an opportunity now for the Palestinians to, uh, to realize that these changes are serious and really the, just the tip of the iceberg, maybe a bad analogy for that part of the world, but, uh, but that we're just, we're really on the precipice of, of what can be a, a, a vastly uh, different geopolitical dynamic over the next five, 10 years and the Palestinians can and should be equal partners in all of that. Rick, do you get into internal politics within the, the states in which you're negotiating their policies, their human rights records, you know, their, their political, um, well, let's call it actions, or do you stay away from that? Is that the 20% that you say, you no, know, we'll choose to look away from that so we can achieve something greater? Or do you say, these are also conditions that we want to change in each of the societies? We tend uh, to be uh, less uh, engaged with internal political dynamics within uh, other countries, save for the United States. And then I think that's where we, we come back to, you know, we are the American Jewish Committee. We are uh, a, a US-based organization. Our bread and butter, our history is all about uh, working to, to bring the full expression of American democracy uh, to the people of this country. That's not to say that we don't export those values and we don't bring those, that, uh, that ethos to the table in other countries. We are, um, but, but we do it through that advocacy lens. And in particular, I'll share uh, the uh, two areas really where we have, um, two policy areas where we have been advocating um, 
vociferously over the last couple of years. One is for many, many nations to declare Hezbollah, the Iranian-backed Lebanese militia terrorist group, uh, to indeed call it a terrorist group and not to fall prey to this uh, false notion that there's a political wing and a military wing when in fact they really are one and the same. And so many countries have climbed on board and said Hezbollah is a terrorist organization. We think that advances uh, human rights. We think that is a positive step forward. The other plank that we've argued for is for countries to adopt what's known as the IRA definition. IRA is the International Holocaust Remembrance Alliance. It is an international consortium that has developed a very clear uh, definition of what constitutes anti-Semitism. And so um, bear with me one second. I'm going to try and deal with a, with a little noise that I'm hearing. Don't worry. It's gardening day in the neighborhood. Um, apologies for that. I'm sure we've all been through no it. But, but what, is, what has happened now is that those countries that, that in fact adopt the IRA definition, it's really, uh, it's rising to a certain level and sending a message to the rest of the world that we understand what anti-Semitism is. We will do everything that we can in our society to recognize it and, and uh, confront it with the apparatus of government to prosecute those who engage in anti-Semitism. We also understand that uh, the notion of anti-Zionism also is anti-Semitism, that the uh, failure to recognize or accept Zionism as the movement of national self-determination for the Jewish people in their historic homeland, the return to their historic homeland, to not accept that is indeed anti-Semitism. So many, many countries are increasingly coming on board and adopting that working definition. And, and I emphasize working definition because it is still a work in progress, but in many ways it's a, it's a marker for, um, for measuring the degree of civility and the degree of um, tolerance is, is never a great word. I don't like to use right, it. Nor do really I. the threshold of, of acceptance and, and recognition of responsibility to look out for uh, the Jewish community in those countries. Something that amazed me, I've been following, because I do a lot of interreligious work, I've been following Dr. Uh, Rabbi David Rosen's work and with great interest and admiration for him and what he's doing, and again, to see what AJC is doing in that realm. And one of the things that was so incredible was the conference in Riyadh, where he was the first rabbi to be in, invited to Riyadh, and also the Muslim leaders coming to Auschwitz. Can you talk a little about those two amazing events? Sure, and I can tell you that Rab Rabbi Rosen is a wonderful colleague. We knew each other at the ADL uh, first, and then now uh, sort of re reunited here at AJC. This too was the culmination of many years of, of open, thoughtful dialogue and recognizing that every small step matters. And so, there were meetings of, there were interfaith meetings that would take place in uh, so-called neutral countries for many, many years, sort of safe places for Jews and Muslims and others to, uh, to gather. The, the uh, holding of the conference in Riyadh was a significant milestone in that evolving relationship. And then ultimately when um, Muhammad Al-Isa, the head of the uh, Muslim World League, led a delegation of Muslim clerics to Auschwitz last January. It was, a, it was an extraordinary moment, an extraordinary culmination in years and years of dialogue. And that is, um, that's how we forge these human connections. That's how we begin to, to break down uh, long held, seemingly entrenched, intractable uh, barriers to, to human understanding. And David Rosen has, uh, been at this for a long, long time. And I, I would argue that that uh, experience over this last year, I've heard him describe it and talk about it was um, 
was absolutely a pinnacle of, uh, of those efforts and a reflection of that you just have to stay with it. And you may you know, be dispirited at times and you may think it's a couple of step backwards, steps backward for every step forward, but you just, you stay in the game, you stay in the hunt. Yeah, it's really impressive. It really is amazing. Not just the visuals from what happened, but hearing the stories. And, and then I remember reading at some point, it may have been in the Washington Post, a, a message that both, the, I'm blanking on Muhammad's last name, was it Isa? I believe Al Isa. Al Isa and Rabbi Rosen wrote together about their shared values and shared experiences. Really incredible and not something people necessarily know is happening. So kudos to AJC and to everybody involved. And I'll mention as well that again, everything, AJC is, is a large organization, but also we can bring it down to a very grassroots micro level. So even here in Southern California, we have uh, what began initially uh, was called the Abraham Society, uh, uh, Christian, Jewish, Muslim participants bringing people together, lay people largely together, and to, to appreciate and, and, and come together and understand what their experience in America has meant for them in terms of safety and protection and, and uh, freedom of, of worship. We've now kind of morphed that group into something called the Muslim Jewish Advisory Council, and the LA group is one of a dozen around the country, speaking out, advocating on issues of the uh, Heather Heyer No Hate Act, which is currently under consideration uh, federally, uh, right. and, other, and other initiatives, and to demonstrate that, that we have so much more in common here in America. We don't really talk about the Middle East so much. We talk about our lives and, and, our, and our hopes for, for, for here in the U.S. Great. Oh, Rick, I'm so appreciative of this conversation with you. And I hope that people watching, and it's not even a hope, I'm sure people watching got insights that they didn't have in terms of, you know, obviously the primary conversation, anti-Semitism, but also looking at what Jewish diplomacy is and what this organization that they may know only by its letters, by its name, actually does. I'm really grateful to you. I want to ask so you one last question, Rick, if I may. have been invited. Thank you. Oh, my pleasure. Both times we've spoken, I've really enjoyed you. Uh, I want to, first of all, wish you gmach a not only to be your family to be written and inscribed into the Book of Life, but to be inscribed for good health and well-being and great fulfillment in this new year ahead. Amen. I just want to ask you, lastly, if how people can, you, you mentioned you the web, just repeat well. that if you would. Of course, it's very simple. It's ajc.org. That will take you to our, our, uh, our national website, the singular website, but there is a drop-down menu that will list the regional offices and you simply have to you know, click on the, on the dot on Southern California and it will take you right to uh, our Los Angeles page and ways to become involved and to, and to learn more about what we're doing. Great, and hopefully we'll do more in, together, uh, our congregation and AJC in the future. That would be terrific. All right, Rick, thank you very, very much. Truly great. My pleasure. Good yontif, everyone. And to good end to you. Thank you.